All right, so there are things you love and things you hate. Things you love are finding the right equation, plugging in your numbers, and getting the right answer straight away, super easy. Things you hate are looking up and finding three equations that all look almost exactly the same and not knowing which one you need to use. So welcome to extended surfaces fin design problems. There's a bunch of different fin design equations that all look almost exactly the same, and the only difference between them is what assumptions you are making to simplify the problem. This cylindrical pin fin problem is going to be solved three different ways, so you can see three different boundary condition assumptions and how they work and why they're different. And one of my favorite things is watching your TA Serenity nap, so whenever possible, if there's room on the screen, we'll keep the kitty cam on there so you can see how she's doing. So start every engineering problem with given find concept assumption solution. As part of my givens, I'm writing down all of the numbers given to me in the problem, and I'm labeling everything that can be labeled on the drawing does get labeled on the drawing. So that's my length and diameter going on the drawing, and then my K and H values, K is thermal conductivity and H is the heat transfer constant to the environment. The thing I'm trying to find is percent error when using the infinite length assumption. And I'm gonna talk about the three different assumptions later on, only two of which are mentioned in the problem, but I'm gonna add a third one on there because it's, it's actually the best one, the most, the most exact correct one. If I wanted to summarize this concept, I'd call it fin design or extended surfaces or more specifically, extended surfaces with uniform cross sections, like a cylinder or just a rectangle. It is possible to have extended surfaces that aren't uniform, something that's like triangular shape or like a pyramid or a cone. But uniform cross section is gonna be way more common. Probably every problem you'll do in this course will have a uniform cross section. Looks like your TA Serenity moved to a more comfortable blanket spot. And this is the whole reason I have this lazy boy in here. I'd never even get to sit in this comfy chair. It's really entirely there for your TA Serenity to nap on. So I already said we're gonna make three different assumptions for this problem. And when you're solving a fin design problem, you, you won't make all three. You're just gonna choose one of these assumptions to make. But for this problem, I'm, I'm making all three just so you can see the three different versions of the fin equation. So first, I'm going to assume that the fin has infinite length. Right, in this problem we were given a length of 10 centimeters, but I'm gonna assume that it's actually infinitely long. Clearly that's not the most accurate assumption, but it is the easiest equation to use, which is why we make the assumption sometimes. The next best assumption, a way to correct that, is to use the actual length, but to ignore heat transfer through the tip, the adiabatic tip assumption, also called the insulated tip assumption. And this is because for most of this, in this case, the cylindrical tip, we're worried about convection off the sides. And it makes the problem a lot easier if we can just include the sides, if we ignore what's happening at the circular cross section on the end. So this will be a more accurate answer than the infinite length assumption. But of course, it's still definitely not perfect because we're ignoring what happens at the tip. Now, the third assumption I'll make for this problem is not actually asked in this problem statement. I'm just adding it on as a bonus for your understanding. And that is to actually assume that there is convection from the tip. And we're gonna do this by using a corrected length, LC. And what we're essentially going to be doing is figuring out how much surface area is on the end of the cylinder and equating that by making the cylinder a little bit longer, a corrected length, such that this extra length added has the same amount of surface area as the end of the tip, the circular area of the tip has. So this third assumption using the corrected length is usually the one you should use because it's gonna be the most accurate. It accounts for the actual length and it accounts for heat transfer from the tip. And I think you'll see in this problem that it's not actually that much more complicated. So the first of the three equations for the infinitely long extended surface with a uniform cross section, the square root of HPKA times delta T, where delta T is the wall temperature minus the environmental temperature. For the adiabatic tip equation, we're gonna start with the exact same, the infinite length equation, and then we're gonna add an extra term to it, a hyperbolic tangent of ML where M is something I'll come back to later, but it's actually gonna involve a square root of HP and KA also, times the length. Now the main thing to not mess up on this problem is that hyperbolic tangent is not the same as tangent. 
It's actually related to exponential functions and it's something kind of complicated, but you can just type it into your calculator, so don't stress about it. And the third equation, when we actually use convection of the tip, is gonna be the exact same equation as for the adiabatic or insulated tip, but instead of using the regular actual length, we've got LC, this is gonna be a corrected length. Oh, and your TA Indiana is here at the perfect time because he actually found a typo in the FE reference manual. He is a very meticulous kitty. Your TA has a fine attention to detail. In the FE reference manual, if you look for at the Finn's equation, you will see that it has LC in it, the corrected length. But in the description of this equation, you'll see assume negligible heat transfer at the tip. So the description for this equation is that the tip is adiabatic or that the tip is insulated, but the actual equation using corrected length does account for heat transfer at the tip. So the FE reference manual is wrong. My equations are correct. If you are going to be assuming negligible heat transfer at the tip, if your tip is insulated or adiabatic, you should be using the actual length, not the corrected length. If you want to account for convection through the tip, that is when you will use LC, the corrected length. So if you're proud of your TA Indy for finding this mistake and to make it clear to all the students out there how to actually use the Finn equation correctly, go ahead and hit a thumbs up and I'll give him one of his favorite churu treats or a popsicle or something to, to, to let him know that you appreciate it. So before plugging in numbers for the infinitely long Finn, let's talk why would you actually make this assumption? And so let's talk about the purpose of extended surfaces at all. The idea is that from Newton's law of cooling, convection is based on cross-sectional area. The more surface area you have, the more convection you have. You have better heat transfer to the environment. But if your heat source is in a wall, when you have an extended surface coming out from the wall, you have conduction happening through your fin, but across the entire length of the fin, you have convection out to the atmosphere. So the entire fin is not going to be at the same temperature as the wall. The part right next to the wall will be just a little bit cooler than the wall. And the further along the fin you go, the cooler and cooler it will get because all along the fin, you have energy being lost to the atmosphere. And eventually you'll get so far out along the fin that the fin is the same temperature as the air. You've essentially reached a point where all of the heat entering the fin by conduction is matched by all of the heat leaving the fin due to convection, and the fin will be at the same temperature as the atmosphere. And so no matter how much longer you make the fin, it's all just gonna be at the exact same atmospheric temperature. And so if you have a fin that you think is long enough that the end of the fin is going to be the same temperature as the air, that's when you get to use the infinite fin assumption. Because if the end of the fin is atmospheric temperature, then all of the extra length you add on is also still gonna be an atmospheric temperature and is not going to affect the amount of convection. All right, so let's plug in numbers. We were given the value of H of 12 watts per meter squared Kelvin in the problem statement. That's the heat transfer coefficient, the convection coefficient. The perimeter of the cross section we can solve using the diameter, it's just pi times diameter or two pi r. So K, the conduction coefficient, that's for the actual material the pin is made out of. We can plug in that number, 237 watts per meter Kelvin, and then multiply by the difference between the two temperatures. Since the temperatures are being subtracted, you don't have to convert to Kelvin. When you have a delta T, you can leave them in Celsius because if you added 273 degrees to both temperatures, it would just cancel itself out. So a little bit of calculator work, I get 1.48 watts. Instead of just assuming that the answer worked out to be watts, let's actually plug in and do the arithmetic with the units, just as a way to double check that I haven't messed up anything. So H in watts per meter squared Kelvin, perimeter in meters, K in watts per meter squared Kelvin, and area in meters squared. This gets me watts squared per Kelvin squared, which when I take the square root of it, means that that square root term at the front is watts per Kelvin. So when I multiply by delta T, which is in Kelvin, that gets me an answer of watts. All right, good. Units worked out. So now looking at the adiabatic tip assumption, that's the insulated tip assumption. This is where we are neglecting heat transfer through the tip. 
you're gonna use the insulated tip assumption when you think the end of your extended surface, the tip, is not at the room temperature. The second criteria for adiabatic tip is you would also want the cross-sectional area of your tip to be very small. So if you have a very long fin with a very narrow cross-sectional area, that would be how you could justify an insulated tip, the adiabatic tip. Because all of your surface area for the very long fin would be very large, and your surface area for the little teeny tiny cross section at the end would be very small. So by ignoring that really small term, your answer would still be pretty accurate. So it starts off with the exact same square root, HP over whatever. <laughs> and so we have that same 1.484 is still the first term. Now we multiply by hyperbolic tangent of ML. And I can grab from the FE reference manual, M is square root of HP over KA. It's the same four terms that we already calculated. So I can plug in the numbers, get about 7.1 for M. And L is my actual real length, in this case, the 0.1 meters for the 10 centimeters which I am just now recognizing I labeled wrong on my drawing. My drawing says 0 0.01 for the length, which is one centimeter. Luckily, my equation uses the correct. 10 centimeters is 0.1 meters, so ignore the number I wrote on my drawing and use the number that I put in my equation. Now, good news for hyperbolic tangent is that you don't have to actually use the definition of hyperbolic tangent, which is this big equation with all these exponentials in it. You can just type this into your calculator. Oh, your TA-ND is back just in time to help show you how to do hyperbolic tangent on a calculator. So if you have the TI-36X Pro like I do, you just hit the tangent key three times to get hyperbolic tangent. The first time you press it, you get tangent. Second time, you get inverse tangent. Third time is hyperbolic tangent. And if you really need to, you hit a fourth time, that'll give you the inverse hyperbolic tangent, which maybe could potentially be useful for these problems. If you needed to solve for length, maybe, you might have to do an inverse hyperbolic tangent. So the hyperbolic tangent of 0.71, which was our m times l, gets us 0.6117, which multiplied through gives us a heat transfer of about 0.9 watts. So to actually answer the, the original question in the problem statement, what is our percent error when using the infinite pin length assumption as compared to the insulated tip assumption, we have our Q infinite minus Q divided by the Q, so 1.4 minus 0.9 divided by 0.9. Gives us an answer of 63.5%. Is if we use the infinite fin length assumption, our answer will be 63% too high. So for this problem, that is, that is really bad error. So you would not want to use the infinite length assumption here for this problem. Okay, but what about convection at the tip? So let's look at this third assumption to see how good our insulated tip assumption actually is. What's the percent error of making that assumption that we could ignore heat transfer through the tip of the extended surface? So the first step is gonna be to solve for the corrected length. To calculate the corrected length, we're gonna figure out what is the area of the end of the surface, just the circular area for our cylindrical fin. And we're gonna divide by the perimeter. And that's because the surface area of a cylinder is perimeter times length. And what we want left is an equivalent amount of extra length. How much longer would we need to make our surface so that the extra surface area we have exactly matches the surface area of the circular end. So the area divided by perimeter will give us the extra length. So our corrected length is 0 0.101. So this is looking like it's probably gonna be a pretty small error because we only added like 1% extra length. So probably ignoring this 1% of area was probably okay to do, but let's go through the math just to be sure. So the same 1.484 is the square root of HPKA. We've got the same value of M as before, the 7.1, but we're just using a corrected length. So plug in my hyperbolic tangent, I get 0.6161. And it may be worth looking at the plot to understand what even is hyperbolic tangent for a second, because we have some general sort of intuition for what sine and cosine look like. Maybe you have some intuition for tangent, but nobody has intuition for what hyperbolic tangent looks like. 
So a hyperbolic tangent to me, I always think of a charging capacitor, like one minus e to the negative x. Hyperbolic tangent starts at zero, it increases steeply, and then gets more and more shallow as it approaches one. So a hyperbolic tangent will start at zero. So if you have a very short, thin length, this hyperbolic tangent term is basically gonna be zero. If your L is close to zero, this hyperbolic tangent will be close to zero. And then as your length goes out to infinity, your hyperbolic tangent term will go to one. And what that means is that this hyperbolic tangent term, if your length is infinity, it goes to one. That's how you get that infinite tip assumption that we made at the very beginning that didn't have a hyperbolic tangent at all. That was the actual assumption. We were assuming that this hyperbolic tangent term was equal to one. So we just crossed it off of the equation and you get that when the length is infinite. So when you type in these numbers into your calculator, your hyperbolic tangent term should always be between zero and one. The shorter your length should be closer to zero, longer your length should be closer to one. So for this problem, I've got 0.616, which is sort of in the middle, sure, whatever, and get a value of Q of 0.91, which was very close to the value of Q we had, assuming the tip was insulated. And in fact, if we do a, another error term with our insulated tip minus the corrected length and divided by the corrected length, we get that making the adiabatic tip assumption only resulted in a 0.7% error. So when you have a long fin with a real skinny cross-sectional area, the insulated adiabatic tip assumption is gonna be pretty good because the amount of extra length that results from the surface area of the tip is gonna be really small compared to the overall length. And extra length added at the end is less important than the length at the beginning anyway. So now equations aren't the only way to solve extended surfaces problems. You'll find in a lot of textbooks that there are figures or plots or tables that you can use as well. So that's gonna be the next video you see linked up on the screen is gonna be an alternative solution method for extended surfaces pin problems.